In this study, we want to talk about the decline of a nation. And we begin by looking at the Old Testament in the nation of Israel. If you recall the history of God's people, they were a united kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon. But after Solomon, the kingdom split into two, into the north and south. The northern kingdom was known as Israel, and the southern kingdom was known as Judah. And what we're reading about in 2 Kings chapter 17 has to do with Israel, the northern kingdom. From the very beginning, it had been involved in idolatry, and it was a plague upon the people throughout that nation's existence. Eventually, the Lord decided to bring an end to the nation of Israel because of its wickedness. We read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17, and we will begin in verse 5. It says, Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their uh, their God things that were not right, and they built for themselves high places in all their cities from the watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. They burned incense on all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them, and they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffen their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molten image and two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served the Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and sorcery and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. You see, Israel, as we mentioned before, was corrupt from the very beginning, setting up calves through which they worship the true God of heaven. But that was a violation of the law that God had given to his people to make no graven image. So when they went through the their life as a nation, the rot that was there at the beginning simply continued to eat away at the heart and soul of that nation. And there was a steady decay and decline throughout the years. God appealed to them, as it said here, through the prophets, appealing to the people to return to him and to do his will. And the Lord sent chastenings against his people to try to get them to clear up their thinking, to be more sober-minded, and to love the Lord and to serve Him. But the people resisted, and they remained stubborn and determined to do their own will, 
determined to be involved in idolatry, which is simply a way that man used to excuse his sins, a way to justify or to make himself feel better about committing sin. What this led to is the ultimate destruction of the nation of Israel at the hand of Assyria. Assyria was a very powerful and cruel nation. They invaded the land of Israel. They laid siege to the capital of Samaria. They conquered that city, and they took the Israelites away captive into foreign lands. And the Bible reveals to us that those people did not return from that captivity. So God destroyed them for their evil and for their wickedness. Our nation right now, the United States of America, is in a time of crisis similar to that of ancient Israel. We are corrupted with sin, iniquity, unrighteousness. We are filled with people who have stubborn hearts, who are intent to do as they please to do instead of serving God. Institutions in our nation are falling apart. They are corrupt. We see the violence in the streets, the riots, the looting, the violence that occurs on a daily basis in some big cities, and it seems to be spreading over time. We see families that are being destroyed because of sin and selfishness. Our nation is not very different from ancient Israel, shortly before the Lord took them off into captivity and wiped that nation off the face of the earth. The United States is in a rapid moral decline. You know, some deny it because they live by a different standard. There are those of us who look at what's called the Judeo-Christian ethic which is an ethic or a belief system, a worldview based on what is revealed in the Word of God. There are some of us who have that as a foundation in our life to one degree or another, and we see the world through that ethic. It's informed by it, and we see what's happening around us as terrible, as regrettable, as a painful thing. There are others who have a humanistic ethic, who have a secularist viewpoint of the world, and they believe what is happening is good. They want to see the destruction of the Judeo-Christian ethic. You know, our nation was founded on that ethic, the ethics that we would read about in the Bible. That system holds fast to things like Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, there is a creator, there is a God, there is an almighty being that brought all things into existence and to whom all of us are accountable. Secular humanists reject that idea. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says there that in the beginning that God made them male and female, and he made male and female in his image. The Judeo-Christian ethic, those of us who hold to that, see that there is male and there is female. The secular humanist rejects the concept of of male and female, of definite, discernible, identifiable genders. Secular humanists reject it. The Word of God supports that. And let's understand that those of us who believe that are anathema to the secular humanist around us. God revealed His will in the Bible in Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, 
verses 20 and 21, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Part of the Judeo-Christian ethic and worldview is not only that God created all things, but God revealed his will to mankind in his word, in the Bible. Secular humanists, because first of all, they reject the idea of God. They say there is no divine message from God. Those who have been compromised that believe that there's a creator, but they do not believe that his will is revealed in the word of God. So there has been a corruption even among those who at one time at least held to the Judeo-Christian ethic. It also is an ethic or a worldview that believes that mankind will be held accountable by God for our actions. In other words, there is a day of judgment that is coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You see, because there is a creator, and because that creator has revealed his will, we are responsible to follow his will. And if we don't, God will hold us accountable to that in the great day of judgment. Those who have done good will be raised to eternal life. Those who have done evil will be cast off into eternal punishment in hell. That is a viewpoint, an understanding, a basic tenet, belief, conviction of those who hold to the Judeo-Christian worldview. Secular humanists say, it's all a myth. It's all fantasy. That man is not accountable to God. Man is only accountable to himself. Uh, another point on that that we realize, as we've just stated, is that we believe we survive the grave and will live either in heaven or in hell forever and ever for all eternity. In Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, Paul writes about this, about how there are those who will either be judged lacking and they will suffer punishment, or those who have done good, who seek for glory and honor in the sight of God, and they will be rewarded with eternal life. In other words, we simply are not physical beings, but we are also spiritual beings created in the image of God, and we are going to live beyond the grave. Secular humanists deny that, and that's why they believe their behavior in this life can be whatever they want it to be, because they are only accountable to themselves. They are not accountable to God, but those of us who hold to, to the Judeo-Christian ethic believe we are accountable to God, and therefore, we want to know how to please him, and we are restricted in our behavior and guided in our lives by the word of God, so that we may please him and have favor in his sight when that day of judgment comes, because we will live beyond this life, beyond the grave. Now, this change that's happening in our society seems to be very rapid to many of us, but we want to understand it has been taking place for decades, a very long time. There's been well over a century of the popularization, popularization of Darwinism. So you go back to the 1800s with Charles Darwin and him postulating the theory of evolution and all the associated ideas with that, how that life developed spontaneously on this planet, in this universe, 
and how that man evolved from a simple organism to what we see as an intelligent being now. The idea of evolution, that's been around a long time now, popularized in our nation. And so that has shifted people's thinking, that has molded society's view of mankind, who he is, what he is, and to whom he is accountable. Again, it's led to that secular humanist philosophy of life. We've had the secularization of education, whereas God used to be a central tenant and his word used to be a foundational principle in education. When children were raised up and when they went to schools, those things were talked about and reinforced, but those things have been pushed out of the public education and public discussion in those educational institutions. And there is much more. There are many factors and many examples. One major factor at the root of it all though, is something that may shock you. It may surprise you when we talk about it a little bit later. But what I want to appeal to you to do in the next segment, what we will discuss, consider it in light of the Word of God, and you will plainly see what is at the root of the problem of our nation now. All the chaos, all the violence, all the corruption, all the decay, the decline can be found in one basic, simple reason. And we will talk about that when we come back. We are talking about the decline of our nation. And it's shocking how it seems to have happened so rapidly. In our lifetime, we've seen a radical change in our nation, but we want to understand that these changes have been progressing for many decades now, and how that the minds of the people of this nation have been influenced away from a Judeo-Christian ethic to a secular humanist ethic and worldview. And with that change, we see the change in behavior and the corruption and the wickedness that has increased abundantly in our land. You think about some of the examples of the decay and the decline of our nation. There are so many, it's really difficult to choose and to point out just certain ones because there's so many. But here's some for you to consider that you know are taking place in our nation. There are elementary-aged children that are being exposed to what's called drag shows, where men who are dressed up like women get up and conduct themselves in a vulgar and provocative manner in front of school-aged children. This has happened on multiple occasions, according to various news reports. It's hard for me to even fathom that that is taking place, but it is. You think about the fact that children are being brainwashed and thereby coerced into believing that the gender the Lord gave them at birth is not who and what they are. And so boys are being told, encouraged, supported that they should be a girl instead of a boy. And girls are being told, encouraged, and supported that they should be a boy. They're receiving psychiatric treatments to reframe their viewpoints, their mind, to put them at ease and try to make them feel comfortable. 
that they are the opposite gender of what God gave to them. They are being treated with chemical treatments that affect their hormones, affect their bodies. They are being physically altered through surgeries. If that's not corruption, perversion, then corruption and perversion, I suppose, do not exist. There is rampant immorality in our nation. Pornography has become a plague upon this land, and it is widely accepted among our society. It's essentially mainstream in our society. And with that, we see that there is premarital sex, fornication. It is very common for a young man and a young woman to cohabit together before they are married. And people think nothing of that. They think nothing of sexual relationships outside the bond of marriage, even outside a bond of any type of relationship with one another. It's just simply for the pleasure of it. Adultery, betrayal of marriage vows, is something that has increased within our society as our society has declined. We could point to political and business corruption. It is so frequent and so massive, it's hard at times to take it all in, of how bad both businesses and our governments on local, state, and national levels have become. It seems that they are selfish, looking out for themselves. They are almost, it seems, purposely trying to destroy this nation. Well, we can go back in our history to see a steady march that has led us to this point. You go back to the legalization of same-sex marriage. That helped to alter people's mindset and to make them more accepting of these other perversions that are now proliferating in our society of how people can be, quote, transgender. And it's not possible, but they're pretending that it is. You think about the legalization of abortion years ago and how people are still fighting to keep it legal in various states, how that has affected people's viewpoint and made them callous to human life and the value of human life. You go back to the banning of the Bible and God and prayer. You look at how the legal system is very often against someone who has moral convictions about making a cake of all things and how they are punishing those who hold to a Judeo-Christian system of belief in their life. And so we see this has been happening little by little through the years. And what we're seeing now is how that that has become a tidal wave in our society. And the question is, will we be able to reverse it? Will we be able to stop it? Just like ancient Israel, remember that they were involved in idolatry. And as we read at the beginning of this study, that God had sent prophets to them to warn them about what would happen, to try to get them to turn back. But it's told us in 2 Kings chapter 17 that when he sent the prophets to them, that the people rejected those prophets. Remember it said in 2 Kings 17 verse 13, yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah, 
by all of his prophets every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffen their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. You see, we stand in the same place as Israel stood before they were destroyed. A nation filled with utter and complete corruption, sin and wickedness. And the message and the warning that God gives in his word is being ignored It's being impugned. It's being mocked. That ought to strike fear in all of us. When we come back, we're going to talk about why this is happening. Why is all of this going on and taking place? Why is there the violence? Why is there the corruption? Why is there the degradation of human life? Why is there a widespread movement to promote perversion? Why is that taking place? We're going to notice that and dig into that when we come back in just a moment. We continue now to talk about the decline of our nation. And as we've noted, all the corruption, all the wickedness, All the perversion. Why is it happening? Well, I want to submit to you that it's not happening because of the education system being corrupted. That's a symptom of the real cause. It's not happening because politicians have failed us to lead us to uphold what's right and good. That's a symptom of the real problem. It is not happening because the judicial system has decayed and judgments are going against what the Bible would say is right and upholding what the Bible would condemn. It's not the judicial system. That's a mere symptom. It's not the family collapsing. That is the problem. That is another symptom. And we don't want to confuse the symptoms with the cause. The cause is that those who claim to be Christians have failed to honor God and to follow his word. That is the problem. Individuals and institutions, religious groups, churches, if you will, they have not adhered to the Word of God. That is what's at the root of the decline and the decay of our nation. Just like ancient Israel and how those people rejected God's commandments and statutes, so it is that people in this land and people who claim to believe in Jesus as the Christ have failed to keep God's commandments, and they have done what is right in their own eyes, just like in the days of the judges. Remember, in Proverbs 14, verse 34, the Word of God tells us there, that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. In Proverbs 14, verse 34. You know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, adheres to the will of God. Remember Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, and beginning there in verse 21. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name 
cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there are people who pay lip service to the Lord, calling him Lord, Lord. And they're very active in doing things that they believe are in service to the Lord. But Jesus points out, notice it yourself, Matthew 7, 21, that he says that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter heaven, but those who do the will of his Father. See, they weren't doing the Father's will. They believed in Jesus as the Lord. They're very active. They're very religious. They're very zealous in the things they do, but they're not doing the will of God. He said in verse 23, I never knew you. They're saying, Lord, Lord, but he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're acting without law, outside the law of Christ. There are many people today who are very zealous, very enthusiastic in their religious beliefs and practices, and they call Jesus Lord, but he's never known them because they don't do the will of the Father. They are in sin. They are in iniquity, just as Jesus condemns these people here in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. You know, there are individuals and religious groups that have not kept the will of the Father. We see them all around us, and you may or may not have recognized it. Let me just give you a very basic thing. And this, again, is one indication, one indication that people have not respected the will of God, the word of God that we have before us in the Bible. Individually, in the Bible, people were known to be followers of Christ by different names. One of those, of course, is disciples. Another one is, of course, Christian. As Acts eleven twenty six says, And when they had found him and brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So these people who are disciples are also called Christians. You can read in the Bible where they were called brethren, and they were described as saints, just like Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And when he wrote to them, he said to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Collectively, these people are known as a church or the church. They're known as the church of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22, or rather verse 2. In Romans 16, verse 16, it says there, the churches of Christ salute you. So they're known as the church, the church of God, churches or a church of Christ belonging to Christ. They're known as the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. So in the Bible, there are specific ways that individuals are referred to. There are specific ways that groups of believers, of Christians, are referred to. But men have decided to adopt their own way of identifying themselves, and when they do that, they depart from the Word of God. Men use terms like Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Catholic. They use all these terms that are not used in the Word of God to refer to God's people. It's not used to refer to disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, some may say, well, that departure seems so small and so insignificant. But notice in 2 John verses 9 through 11, 2 John verses 9 through 11, 
Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. When men make up their own names by which they identify themselves, they've departed from the doctrine of Christ. They've begun to follow the doctrines and commandments of men. And when they do that, they divided themselves from everyone else. You think about this. Why do they identify themselves with these specific names? Because they don't want to be identified with others. So a Lutheran doesn't want to be identified as a Baptist, and a Baptist doesn't want to be identified as a Catholic. And so these names bring division among those who say they are followers of Jesus Christ. So that departure is one step away from the Lord, and the motive is not an excuse. As Matthew chapter 7 very clearly points out, most people are motivated to try to serve the Lord, but he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These churches of men, following the doctrines and commandments of men, have decided on their own organizations of their religious groups that you can't find in the Bible. They've decided on their own worship that you can't find in the Bible. They've decided on their own works that they do as churches that you cannot read about in the Bible. So they've departed, and those departures come little by little over time to the point that they have appointed women as preachers and leaders when the Bible shows, the New Testament specifically shows, that male leadership is God's plan and God's pattern. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 12, or verse 11, it says, let a woman learn in silence and all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. You see, they change the name, and then they change the practice that's revealed in the Bible. And because these changes have taken place, the door has been opened to change anything the Bible teaches. You know, there are religious people who say they believe in Jesus Christ and say they believe in God, and they've compromised on the creation of the universe, trying to take secular humanist views of evolution and shove them into the Bible and marry those two things together. So they don't believe in a special creation by an almighty God that brought all things into existence in six days. No, they try to compromise with the atheist humanist of the world. You see how they start with one small thing? They've sown the wind, and now they're reaping the whirlwind, if you will. They reject God's moral law. You think about How many churches, for instance, like the Presbyterian Church USA, that is perfectly fine with abortion, they say it is acceptable. Well, if men can compromise on that, you know, they can compromise on anything. And you see how that people have compromised on the Lord's law for marriage Have you ever read Matthew 19, 9? In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus was asked a question, you know, can a man just divorce for any reason? Now, here's what the Lord tells those people who question him about God's will on marriage. In Matthew 19, 9, and I say to whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. How many churches actually uphold that? They're perfectly fine with people getting divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried in the second, third, and fourth marriage. And it's not divorces over sexual immorality. It's divorces over we can't get along anymore. We've fallen out of love. All kinds of reasons. So they compromised on that. 
They've compromised on homosexuality and allowing homosexuals to come in and to be members without repenting of their sin, to come in and to be leaders without repenting of their sin. So you see how the small compromise, the small departure in the eyes of some leads to these larger departures, this acceptance of ungodliness, perversion, and immorality. And there's much more. There are more and more of these churches, so-called, that are accepting of the transgender movement. And this is why you have things like an ordained Methodist minister leading a prayer in Congress where he appealed to a Hindu god, and he closed that prayer with a men and a women. You can't make that up. You think about this. What is at the root of the problem? Why is it that the Episcopal Church can ordain homosexual leaders? Why is it that worship has morphed into a country concert where it's more like an episode of American Idol than it is reverent worship of God? How can that happen? How can those things change over time? How do we get to where we are? Well, it's because people who claim to believe in Jesus as the Christ have compromised with the world around them and departed from the oracles of the living God. Until men and women and the religious groups with which they are associated return to the Bible alone as a rule of faith and practice, the decay and the rot of our nation is going to continue. So we appeal to you, we urge you to examine the Bible for yourself, compare the religions of the world around you with what the Word of God teaches. See the differences. Reject the doctrines and commandments of men and submit to God fully and wholly in your life. If we can help you in this, if we can help you better understand the will of God and to see the corruption, the perversion of religion in the world around us, in our society that is at the root of the decay, then please reach out and let us know.